call to order the Board of Education meeting on Monday, February 27th, 2023 in the Coolidge Professional Development Center. Could I have a roll call, please? Audrey Adamson? Here. Justin Anderson? Present. Jet Desmet? Here. Kate Schaefer? Here. Maria S. Trigueros? Here. Andrew Weyer? Here. Aaron Waldron Smith? Here. Can we Corinne, all I gotta do the girls. Corinne Sorry. Holmes? Here. Ava Saucedo Sara? All right, now you can all rise for the pledge. <laughs> I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Number three is the approval of the minutes. A is the minutes of the open session of the regular Board of Education meeting of February 13th, 2023. Can I have a motion, please? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All right, moving on to B. Minutes of the closed session of the closed session of the regular board meeting of regular Board of Education meeting February 13th, 2023. Can I have a motion, please? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. We have no public comment. We do not. All right. Mr. McDermott and Dr. Savage, you're up. All right. Good evening, everybody. Um, we have been doing a lot of work behind the scenes for the last several months, uh, doing some planning and some projecting in terms of our district facility improvement plan. Uh, we've got some slides to present to you tonight. Uh, Mr. McDermott's going to be chiming in, um, and we will go ahead and dig in. So the purpose for the presentation tonight is that the Board of Education has the opportunity to choose its next large-scale facility improvement project. This evening's goal is to present options, which were taken from the 10-year strategic district facility study, which was completed in 2021. So looking back before we move forward, as you recall, the district strategic goal in 2020-2021, which seems like a really long time ago, review and revise the 10-year strategic facilities plan, administrative procedures, and school handbooks where school equity can be improved. This particular presentation is focusing on facility improvement. A 17-person committee representing both internal and external stakeholders of staff, parents, and community members were comprised to make up this district facility study. The committee was charged with evaluating existing facilities, considering future needs, receiving input from stakeholders, and they created and uh, presented a revised executive summary, which I delivered to you uh, to the Board of Education on May 24th of 2021. The, the priorities of that committee were as follows to focus on student needs and making sure that those needs were addressed above and uh, before everything else. Equitable learning environments was a must for all students, regardless of where they live in our communities. They reviewed the former district facility committee's decisions uh, from 2010. Uh, the committee did not prioritize the recommendations and they also did not uh, give the Board of Education any information regarding how any future building would look, how it would be designed or be constructed. So I want to make sure that we've got this timeline in our heads before we take a look at different options for you to consider. So during the month of February, uh, Mr. McDermott and I um, have spent one-on-one -on -one time with each and every one of you going through a lot of this information. So this month now, February and into March, the Board of Education has the opportunity to select a project which really means you're directing the district to initiate a multi-year planning process. It's important to note that the Board of Education could also choose to delay making a selection at this time for a year or some other designated time down the road. The three school years shaded in blue would be designated for planning and designing and construction. So the school years of 23-24, 24 and 25 would be slated for project planning, parent and student and staff and committee and other stakeholder input, as well as the design phases. 2026 and 27 would be the construction year for any project the board should choose to um, elect to move forward with. 
So that means with that timeline in August of 2027, students would be moving into the new completed project or the new renovated project, whichever is decided. The important thing to note, and you'll see this threaded throughout the presentation, that this particular timeline is incredibly important because it allows for any project that the board would decide to be cost neutral for taxpayers. So please keep this timeline um, in mind as we navigate through the rest of this information. After the uh, uh, fall of 27, where students would be moving in at that time, whatever project the board decides, they could then move forward with planning and making decisions on what would be done with it, with any property that would be vacated. With, with regard to finance, you have to understand where we're at. We've been talking a lot of time in the last two, three years. I said, hey, your next project is about due, you know, stay tuned, stay tuned, stay tuned. So we've been talking about that. And the reason why it's now or in the near future is because our bonds will be coming off the books. We will be paying them off. Our mortgage will be paid off. So we talk about the 22 million for the 1%. That was done in 1718. And remember that was mainly the high school HVAC project, the Bartlett Performing Arts Center, Franklin project, the uh, LED lighting upgrades and the uh, parking lots at the elementary. So that's paid off at the end of 27, 28. And then if you talk about the 14 million we did with the property tax bonds for the PE facility, that too will be paid off in 25, 27, 28. So you could let the taxes go down if you wanted to. And then if you come back, you're gonna, you're gonna have a, a, an up and down effect to taxpayers. And we've always said, let's try to keep it neutral and that's easier on the taxpayers, allows us to make some planning decisions that would not increase taxes from what they are today. So that's the key. It's these project bonds are going to be retired in 27, 28. So this allows you to pay almost $5 million between these two. So if you did a $50 million project, it would be paid off in 10 years. If you did a $100 million project, it would be paid off in 20 years. You got interest in a whole bunch of things in there, but that makes it simple for us to understand is the, the projects we're gonna do, we're gonna figure out what the timeline is based on the amount of money we're gonna budget for that in the future. And as you always know, it takes a while to do a major project. So it doesn't take a year. You got design, you got a new board that's gonna come in, they're gonna have to do a lot of the design work. You're gonna have to determine what you're doing based on a project. So it, the time is now or in the near future to make that next choice. We, we've done the high school HVAC, we, done, we have done the, the PE facility, we've done Aspire. This is the same process we use for most all of those. So just a review of the six facility committee recommendations that were made to you back in May of 2020, uh, 2021. So the first recommendation was continue current school operations at the following sites, Bicentennial, Hamilton, John Deere, Wilson, and Moline High School. Recommendation two was to make strategic decisions for future use at the following sites, Jefferson, Butterworth, Coolidge, Washington, and Lincoln Irving. There were a variety of factors around why those buildings were identified, such as land around the buildings, ease of access, and so on and so forth. The third recommendation is to consider providing general education busing throughout the district for all students living a set distance from schools. Number four, consider future use of Jane Adams and Franklin properties for possible preschool or other district uses. Number five, Allendale, Logan, and Willard should be retired meaning not programmed for future use and sold when vacated, which is basically any of our district properties now over 100 years old, which are currently those three. And lastly, number six, consider future plans for the Coolidge building once current staff have relocated. So this Board of Education has already made the decision to uh, move students out of this building. We did that last summer, but we still have a number of staff here. We have the Regional Office of Education, we have the Facilities and Maintenance Department, we have Records Department, 
And we also have our school psychologists and social workers that are occupying office space upstairs. So those were the six recommendations uh, that the committee made in 2021. Several of them a carryover from the committee in 2010. So some of these re uh, recommendations keep uh, threading along. Just a uh, reminder of the age of our facilities in order. You can see uh, the buildings that have been identified as having some uh, remodeling, as well as the buildings that are identified as being over 100 years old. So this is just a reminder of the age of our facilities. And the sites uh, that are not attended, Allendale, Coolidge, and Morton. So from that, really, from those recommendations, there really are five possible projects. Each one has pros and cons. Each one has advantages and disadvantages that the board would want to consider. So the first possible project would be to add a wing onto Butterworth and create a four to five section flagship elementary school. That would require vacating Adams as an attendance site and combine Jane Adams with Butterworth with an addition onto Butterworth. The second possible uh, possibility for the board to consider is to add a wing on to Washington. Again, to create a multi larger section flagship elementary school that would require vacating Franklin as an attendance site and combining Franklin with Washington. Now, obviously you're thinking of advantages and disadvantages of each of these, and we'll go through those in just a minute. The third option would be to rebuild or renovate Coolidge for a five to six section flagship elementary school. And to do that, we would vacate Logan, our second oldest school, uh, vacate Logan and Roosevelt as attendance sites and combine Logan and Roosevelt at the new Coolidge site, a larger flagship, uh, multi, larger multi-section elementary school. The fourth option would be to continue renovations at Moline High School. The board has been aggressive in the past five years, making a number of improvements, and we could continue with that as well. There are needs at the high school, just, or just as there are across the district. Renovations to the cafeteria, making a determination to cover some or all of the courtyard to gain that uh, square footage, uh, common spaces, bathrooms, pool, Multimedia Center, lots of opportunities for upgrades should the board can, uh, choose to continue with renovations at Moline High School. And then the last one would be to add a wing onto Lake and Irving for a four to five section flagship elementary school. This would then, uh, the next step would be to retire Willard, 124 years old, our oldest building, uh, uh, born in 1899, and combine Willard with Lake and Irving. So that's just a sort of a broad overview. Clearly there's pros and cons to each, but those really are the choices that floated to the top from both the 2010 committee and the 2021 committee. So now just briefly, we kind of dug into those pros and cons for each of them. And you're gonna see a lot of this stuff be the same. So I'll kind of go through these quickly. For positives, obviously, if we chose to add on to Butterworth, uh, and combine Adams with Butterworth, it would be for improved academic achievement. We would positively affect the learning environment by creating a larger sectioned elementary school, less redrawing of school boundary lines, economy of scale and operational savings. Butterworth has a lot of land around the school for development and planning. And then on every single one of these I have highlighted, the proposed timeline allows for the project to be cost neutral to taxpayers. On the negative, we put the, the, the ballpark just projected cost as a negative for each of these because it is going to be a negative. Every project is going to be expensive. Um, so this um, really just uh, ballpark price of 50 million for this project. And really the other negative would require logistical planning for relocation place for Butterworth students during the year of construction. You'll see that as a theme uh, in some of these other ones as well. Similarly, if the board could choose to uh, take advantage of the space around Washington and combine Franklin with Washington, again, improved academic achievement and learning environment, less drawing of lines, operational savings. The HVAC and sprinkler work slated for um, this summer at Washington would help get a jump on those future costs related to that renovation project. Um, and of course would be cost neutral to taxpayers. 
On the negative, again, ballpark, just complete ballpark at 50 million for that addition. Again, we'd have to find a place to put the kids during the year of construction. But really the biggest negative is that Franklin was just completely remodeled. Um, positive for Franklin, but negative to choose to vacate Franklin, I guess I should uh, clarify. Um, and you've got traffic flow issues uh, around Washington. Coolidge renovation or rebuild would become potentially a, a multi-large section, five to six section elementary combining Roosevelt and Logan. It makes the most logistical sense in terms of construction because Logan kids and Roosevelt kids can stay in their home schools during the complete process. That's a positive. Um, lots of economic development for the opportunity and the um, uh, access that it has to the avenue of the cities. Logan is the second oldest school, 103 years old, so it would uh, take care of that. Coolidge is the third oldest with zero remodeling uh, at 90 years old. Eventually then the district could move out of Allendale to a more appropriate modern office space. Um, Allendale was built in 1906, which makes it 117 years old. And really not being ADA accessible uh, poses a lot of challenges at Allendale for not only employees, but for our families, visitors, and guests that come to the district office. And it would reduce future maintenance costs to, the, to Allendale. It's beautiful and it's, it's a, a very um, just beautiful building, but there are a lot of costs associated with maintaining a building like that. And again, any project you choose would be cost neutral. This project is projected to be the most expensive at ballpark 80 million. It would really limit other projects for potentially 20 plus years. It would require redrawing of boundary lines. Uh, there would be extensive asbestos abatement that would need to be dealt with here at Coolidge. And it would likely cost more to remodel from the inside out than to demo it and then rebuild. Um, and there would be costs associated to adapting Roosevelt for a future district office, ROE and facilities department. So lots to think about there with that project choice. To left, uh, continued renovations at Moline High School. Again, we're talking about cafeteria, courtyard, common space, the pool, bathrooms, and so on. One benefit as a one high school district is any dollars that are put into Moline High School benefit every single student in the district. That's a positive. Um, there would be improved student safety. It would reduce future maintenance costs to the current cafeteria and pool. It would complete major projects at the high school for the next 20 years. The high school would be essentially done for a, a couple of decades. Less, in, less impact on students than other projects. It would allow the district to con continue to be competitive with neighboring districts and the recent renovations that those districts have completed. Again, this project would be cost neutral. To the negative, this cost could be projected at anywhere from 10 million to 45 million, depending on which pieces the board would choose to pick off and, uh, and uh, proceed with in whatever order they would choose. So you might choose the pool or you might choose the cafeteria and that would obviously impact cost and time and so on and so forth. These common spaces does prioritize projects over learning environments such as classrooms and some of the other projects. There would be some interruption to student learning. Long-term bonding would prevent and limit other district projects for 10 to 15 years, as Mr. McDermott was identifying in terms of the, um, the length and duration of those bonds. And the Board of Education has allocated approximately $45 million to Moline High School in really the past five years. So those are a number of factors to consider. And the last project, um, adding a wing onto Lincoln Irving and retiring Willard, improves academic achievement and the learning environment. Again, Lincoln Irving would become a, a multi-section large flagship elementary school. It addresses Willard as the oldest building in the district, uh, born in 1899, 124 years old, with serious ADA issues. We were talking about that if a parent has a disability, at this point, they can't get to their child's classroom. They can get to the gym as there's a flush door 
uh, but there really isn't anywhere to go from there that's accessible to a parent or a community member or a guest with uh, disabilities. So that's something to think about. Less redrawing of lines, you still would have operational savings, positive economic development and impact to the neighborhoods in that boundary. The board has already purchased land around Lincoln Irving for development and planning. The board has already purchased five lots and there are two left. The HVAC work slated for this summer at Lincoln Irving would get a jump on those costs for any future renovations. So that's a positive project would be cost neutral. And really on the negative side, it is again projected at 50 million. And we would have some planning and prep uh, for uh, navigating logistical space for the students of Lincoln Irving during the year of construction. So that's really just a breakdown of the uh, five projects and a ballpark uh, pros and cons. I think the priorities for consideration, and just as we did with the latest 10 year study, you know, that was kind of handed to us. And, and the cabinet, you know, facilities director, we, we did talk about this and debate it. And, and there are, these are all good projects. Unfortunately, we have to choose one or, or, or decide what we're going to do in the future. But really, what are the considerations for the priorities and what do we think they were? It's really the cost of the project being fiscally responsible. If you did these all, I don't think you could do it fiscally responsible. I don't think we could do it, but I'm just exaggerating. So you got to pick one that you think you can be successful in. And this would be very consistent with what we did at Bicentennial, what we did with the two middle schools when we, brought, when we upgraded those and brought the sixth graders in, and what we did at Hamilton the PE facility, the BPAC, Aspire. This is all the same thing. You pick a project and you try to be successful moving forward. Uh, the other thing is we really concentrate is equitable learning environments for all students. You know, we all know, I'm just gonna pick two schools. If your child's going to Willard and you have another child going to Hamilton, there's a big disparity between that equitable environment for learning. I'm not saying they don't have the same opportunities, and, and there, we have great test scores in all, a lot of these buildings, but at certain point, you got to say, what is the equitable learning environment? With Willard or Logan, it was built in a, a pre-ADA type capacity and it, it had some challenges. Student achievement, we look at that. We should look at that. You know, some, sometimes you're going you're gonna to look at a project like the high school that has less student achievement outcomes than possibly you know, one of the other projects. ADA accessibility. Obviously, we talked about Willard. There, that's only slightly older, like 35 years than Willard, but Willard is really, really a challenge. Where Logan, you can get, go in and it's all level and really it, it is accessible for uh, the ADA reasons. Long-term vision of the district's facility. We just didn't dream these up. They came about in 2008. They were reviewed in 2010. That's how we knew to buy and acquire land around buildings or not around others because we've been having that vision for a long time. So no, nobody's surprised. The only difference that I can think of between the 2021 and the 2008 was really we had a vision for Franklin that was quite different than what we'd say now. And also, we thought an elementary would be at Jefferson more so than here because we moved the students from here to, to the high school. So minor changes in the grand scope of things. So, you know, this is really adhering to that. And then that helped us make several, several, several actions along the way. We have bought a lot of the property against Lincoln Irving. So we knew we wanted to grow in that area for a building. Uh, we had decisions to not AC air conditioned Willard when we had Esser. Now we also thought we were gonna air condition Jefferson, but with the cost and everything, it just got too high. But, but we didn't make that same choice for Jefferson as we did for Willard, because I don't even know how you'd air condition Willard. <laughs> Probably window units and everything else, and we can go into that and other things. But then students already moved out of Coolidge. That's why this is a viable. That wasn't viable in 2010, but 2021, that strategic plan made it viable. So those are the priorities we listed and when we thought about that. Now, I'm gonna tell you the other thing is 
not every project was listed among these five. We picked the five major ones. We didn't touch Jefferson because we thought there was other challenges that were needed. So, you know, there's a lot of challenges in the district. Unfortunately, we're trying to do our best to incrementally move forward in the educational process for our facilities. So just one or two slides left, really kind of just sum this up. While we have made significant gains over the past several years, such as all of the projects at the high school, the Aspire, the Bartlett, the PE facility, and many other projects, uh, there's still plenty of need to go around across the district. And it's also important to know that choosing one of these five projects doesn't discount the need of the other projects. It just takes one off the list. So it's not like choosing one means the others are not important. That's not the case. This Board of Education is educated and informed and also possesses the leadership and the authority to make a project decision in the near future if it chooses to. And then future boards will have the wonderful opportunity, it's always a positive, to be a part of the design, pro <coughs> all the way from the design process to the ribbon cutting for students, staff, and families. Um, possible timelines. Again, uh, most of the month of February, uh, Mr. McDermott and I have had one-on-one -on -one sessions with each of you individually to provide background information, provide an opportunity for one-on-one -on -one question and answer, and to give each individual board member time to process. It's a lot of information and a lot of things to think about. Obviously, tonight on the 27th here, we are making our initial presentation to all of you for the first time as a collective board of education. And then really the next meeting in March, we'd like the board to take the opportunity to direct Mr. McDermott and I to initiate a multi-year planning process for whichever project the board chooses. And again, whichever project sticking and adhering to this timeline would keep the project cost neutral for tax. So really that is the last slide. I just kind of pulled some shots of some recent uh, projects, uh, upgrades, beautifications, improvement of the learning environment, improving, improving services and access to students. And a lot of these projects, if not the majority of them and the several before that, were just really superintendent and CFO recommendation based on the district facility study. So I want to open it up to the board for questions. I know you've had some time to think about this, um, but certainly, you know, take the next couple of weeks to process all of this information. Questions? I have one. Um, if we were to choose the Logan, or I'm sorry, Lincoln Irving project, do you think we would have those last two um, properties purchased or can we move on with, with Here, it still there, I'm not sure. I'm, yeah. It, here's what I would so say long. is that neighborhood knows what the school district is. I've talked to the one, the homeowner still. I've had indirect conversations with the other. I think that will not be a problem in the future. However, with that said, I can always say like Hamilton, there's a house right next there. We do not require people to vacate their property. You know, we're, we try to be good neighbors. If they so choose to live there, that's their prerogative. However, what I would say is the, the key purchases on that block were made already and mm -hmm. we own. Okay. So you were probably able to move forward and most likely those two properties would be playgrounds or green space. Okay. Or dry, I mean, a parking, not playground. Questions? I have one. Would Lincoln Irvine still continue to be a dual language school? I think that's a great question. Obviously, there would be no changes to programming. In fact, the larger facility would allow for um, program additions. So yes, dual language would remain as well as mono language, as we know the importance of um, not requiring students to move out of their boundary school if they're not choosing dual language. So being able to adjust and now provide mono and dual, while well, we did it sort of on the fly, <laughs> working with the city of Moline and World Relief, um, yes, it would be every intention to maintain all the staff and all the programming, uh, but just positively affecting the learning environment. I, I will go one step further with that, is when we built Logan, or excuse me, Hamilton, we estimated the capacity of Hamilton and we drew the boundaries associated with that capacity. 
What we did not anticipate is the transfer request out of Lincoln Irving to be in a mono program. So this, if you did choose one of you know, the options of Lincoln Irving, it could free up some uh, space at Hamilton. I'm not saying a hundred kids, but I know we have 50 in there that are from that neighborhood. So we have seen some movement right. already with families coming back just because it's a lot easier to get to and new families moving into that boundary or who can stay. If, if they, you know, prefer blank uh, instruction in English. Thank you. Any other questions or discussion? The, the only thing I would like you to, these numbers that we gave, you had to have a number. You guys could make logical decisions without a number, but we haven't designed a building. So the numbers that are used for the elementary are more aligned to bicentennial cost. You go into Bicentennial, it's a beautiful building. But if you go into Hamilton, there's a wow factor. More of these costs are aligned because they're neighborhood schools, meaning you know, Lincoln, Washington, Butterworth. However, this one, you might want a wow factor. So that's why you're at 80 million versus 50 million, plus you're at a six, seven section school here because Logan and Roosevelt are bigger. <laughs> That's why the cost is significantly higher. Plus you have to redo a, a, a revamp of, of Roosevelt to get that as an office space for the ROE and, and potentially us. And as we know, we did a wing at, at Moline High School for Aspire and that was like 3.5 million. So it's, it, there is some cost there and we don't know what those are, but those are ballpark, have you think in a magnitude. <laughs> Because until that design is designed, you don't know what you're going to spend. And even after the design's done, just like the HVAC, you're still wrong. Or I'm wrong. I'm wrong. So, so that's, that's where we're at. Um, I just um, urge the board that any questions or information you have, let's get it taken care of. So we can have a good discussion on March 13th and we can move forward with a decision and direct our administration. Yeah. Let's make sure that we do our homework. Let's make sure we're ready to go. Um, that why we're being um, good stewards of time and money. Uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, I think we're on the verge of uh, a large investment in pre-K education. I, you know, the governor signaled that that is a priority and on the federal level too. So I think we need to keep that in mind too as we're moving forward. The history person in me would also like you to think about the things that were happening before some of these schools were built. I mean, we're talking pre-World War I, we're talking the Titanic hasn't sank. William McKinley is the president. Civil War has only been about 30 years past. So think about that when you're making decisions. Think about- 1899, that was Grant, wasn't it? Yeah. In 1899? Yeah. yeah. That was Grant, wasn't it? Lamphere. Lamphere, you're up. <laughs> you're, you're on. Ryan, oh, thank you. Hmm. I don't have a social studies endorsement or anything. Hmm. Librarian. <laughs> <laughs> thank you for being here, Mr. Lampier. <laughs> 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 All right, I'm just asking that, like Andy said, think about what's going on at the federal level. Think about what's going on at the state level. Think about how it affects the whole community instead of just a neighborhood or this is the this is big picture and we need to be mindful of our responsibility here thank you thank you yes brian you're going to have a quiz about who the president is you're doing social studies oh yeah yeah well i'll tell you this we can guarantee you this will be cost neutral to the taxpayer <laughs> <laughs> the social studies curriculums um so uh anyway um thanks for having us here tonight uh we're excited uh um, to talk a little bit about social studies and um, just want to give you a brief overview with elementary social studies about where we've kind of been with things. So you guys are um, educated on that. Um, you know that uh, I think all of you know, like in 2020, I came in as assistant superintendent for elementary, elementary teaching and learning. I was a brand new position. Um, when uh, you're the new guy coming in, people are in your ear. They're always asking you for things, right? And one of the things we identified early on was social studies. Um, before, and during that time, if you recall, we were adopting a brand new ELA curriculum, 
right? And that, that was during COVID when COVID hit. So things were a little crazy, but we stuck with that curriculum. We adopted it. And um, what we knew at the time was that new ELI curriculum it had some good connections with social studies. Um, so we didn't know because we didn't really dive into it. Um, but we knew we had good, uh, good resources from our past homemade units, right? So the last couple of years, what we've been doing is kind of analyzing those units um, that we're using. We made them available. We took the best of the best of our homemade social studies, trying to navigate a pandemic and get through um, that. We, we were able to at least identify what was working, what teachers liked, and we integrated that in through our uh, elementary system guidance. And we also then created grade level resumes, which was basically a generic PowerPoint that had all the resources by grade level so teachers could use that. But, you know, that still, in my mind, wasn't enough because we knew some grade levels had various um, resources that were, let's say, a little better than others, right? So in fourth grade, if you know anything about both fourth grade social studies, it's very specific to the Illinois standards, like the, the Illinois history. So um, uh, we, we had to kind of navigate that. So bring us to uh, kind of like the end of last year, we started talking a little bit about what we could do to move forward and get some resources that our teachers could use. And we had adopted my view, uh, which was our ELA curriculum. And uh, this is about the same time we were engaging in the math pilots. We actually, we actually did a lot last year. Uh, remember we brought on mystery science last year too, um, which was great. Um, and, and, and so, but where we are with social studies is we had a group of teachers come together and say, hey, we'd be willing to try something. And it was logical to look at what we already had with the LA with Savas because they had connections there and they had resources there. And one of the goals is to get some resources that hit the standards that allow teachers to, to just pull something if they needed something that would correlate um, with, with those standards they wanted to teach. So we started this pilot this year and uh, fortunately enough, um, we actually had some money um, from the ESSER set aside, ESSER three set aside. If you look at that grant and you look on our website, it'll kind of tell you, but that set aside, which is a specific amount of money that we have to use for education. We can't use it all for HVAC and those type of upgrades. So with that being said, what we looked at was called My World Interactive. It's a Savas product. It's a K-5 product. Um, and this is the informational slides. Um, I'm going to introduce the teachers here that, that we're going to talk about a little bit tonight in a second, but I just wanted to give you an overview of why this product seems to be fitting, uh, fitting uh, what we need for social studies. Um, it does have that literacy skill piece, which is important because remember, we had that ELA curriculum, my view, which was a Savas product, and there was a loose correlation to standards covered in that, but this kind of builds on that in, in, in depth, which that's something our teachers were looking for but it has that reading support. And, and on here, if you look, it, it has a lot of vocab. And one thing we're really focusing on and, and reading is trying to get those reading scores up. If you look at our winter map data, we know that reading is an area that we're, we're really trying to build. And this is something that we thought if we could um, bring in something that correlates with that curriculum, that would help and then check those social study standards. So this is just some examples, but it does have um, uh, individual, uh, well, it doesn't show you up there, but some of that there, there's individual leveled readers that are available. So, so where I'm going with that, or you might hear from the teachers today, is if they want to engage in ELA time, they can pull level literacy texts from this resource that covers social studies. So they're essentially doing a little bit of ELA and social studies at the same time. And you know how it is as a teacher. Sometimes resources don't work out or students aren't engaged in them. And this allows for more learning in the same amount of time. So that's something we're excited about that we're getting some feedback on. But if teachers don't have time, which right now they don't, they have just what's called, um, when, when they, they don't, they don't. There's a lot on their plates, right? I mean, they don't have time for new things. And, and what they need to do is sometimes they just need to reach for something that can check that box. And these have activity packs with them. So when we engaged in this pilot, we went to Savas and said, give us everything social studies for K-5 that, that's the Cadillac, throw it all in, let us try it, right? Because we, we knew uh, coming through COVID with a new ELA curriculum, looking at a new math curriculum, there's a ton on our teacher's plates. And that's what my reference is. They don't have time. They wanna be able to, to get to something, teach, hit those standards and move on. And I think that um, 
these My World Interactive Packs, they have the digital piece, they have the hands-on piece, they have the individual readers, they have um, just a lot of resources for our teachers to use. And again, I go back to the cost is very affordable and we can sustain that for a long period of time. And right now, I just wanna remind you again, we have really nothing besides our self-created resources that we were pulling from and some loose correlations with the current MyView curriculum. So I'm gonna, um, I'm gonna share this with you, but if you wanna learn more about it, because um, I put this on here, you can scan this, it'll take you right to the ELA website, uh, the Savas website, uh, excuse me, the um, social studies website for Savas on my world, and you can learn more about that. So I will share that with all of you. But I do want to get really what you guys want to hear is a teacher perspective. So I'm going to um, introduce Marque Eastman, who is a kindergarten teacher at Franklin. And she was one of the um, teachers that, you know, I, I give them credit, like we're coming out of the pandemic, right? And here's the curriculum guy saying, hey, do you guys want to pilot a new resource? And they, they were like all in on it. And so I just thank him enough for taking the time to do that. So we'll let Marte go first, and then I'll introduce uh, Crystal and Mark. Yes. Um, so for kindergarten, I don't know if you're, how familiar anyone is with kindergarten, but everything we do, is, we tend to make it play-based, fun, engaging. Um, so one of the things that My World has is they have songs that are on the online portion that we sing and listen to. The kids really catch on to it and it builds the content that way. Poems, um, the online content's really great. And then the activity guide that Brian was just talking about is the meat and potatoes of the kindergarten. Um, we, have, we have access to the additional pieces as well. The activity guide is the hands-on component that kindergarten really wants. Um, last week, the lesson we did was on our neighborhood and we ended up making a map of our Franklin neighborhood and the kids just loved adding in, I'm drawing my own house and I'm drawing the way that they see Franklin and those things. So um, the activity guide is the the hands-on piece that I think the social studies curriculum was lacking for kindergarten before. And uh, we have Mara Pinello and Crystal Gasplain. They are both at Hamilton, and uh, we're giving you the opposite end of the elementary, the fifth grade perspective on it. Okay, so uh, as we've been kind of going through some of the MyView alignment and looking at our reading standards, we've noticed that there's some gaps in the MyView curriculum that need to be filled. And the My World curriculum, we're able to pull from that and help fill in some of those gaps or those standards that are missing or not covered appropriately or very well. Uh, the hands-on projects are great. We did an inquiry into the American Revolution in fifth grade at mm -hmm. Hamilton. And the grade level information is spot on with our social studies standards. We go through the early colonies, Revolutionary War, Western expansion, Civil War. Um, There's a project for each one, and very hands on. Kids love them so far, they're very into it. So it kind of helps kill two birds with one stone in filling those gaps, but then also meeting the social studies standards as well. Um, and I'm just going to add for the term of secondary. Um, Prior to, you know, the, you're two, two birds of one stone, right? Like, and I think that piece of it is, is it's great to hear that because when we implemented um, the system-wide guidance last year for elementary, we also identified a 45-minute science block that with our mystery science adoption in bringing in science. And, and you know, um, I'm so excited because that's been doing so well and, and, and maybe we'll have to share out the details on that. But that 45-minute science block, because I went back to what I said earlier, there's just not enough time. Teachers don't have enough time. But what we found is, um, and, and um, Crystal and Mara kind of piloted, like, uh, or they were talking about maybe doing like a science block of a quarter and then a, um, a social studies block a quarter. And based on combining some of that time inside their ELA block, which you heard mentioned, we can fit this in, is what I'm saying. And it works well in like, just like science, we, you know, I, I took my daughter to school today and I go, what's going on today? She goes, oh, we got mystery science. And like, that's just awesome to hear, right? And, and knowing that kids are getting a solid curriculum in ELA, math, science, and now social studies, I think is, you know, that's how we're going to raise the bar and close the achievement gap for our students and hit those standards. So um, I uh, will we'll hang around in case you have questions, but we'll let Matt continue with the secondary. Good evening, everyone. I had a feeling there was going to be a historical debate, so I'm glad I invited Trent to come to the uh, While you're here, I'm going to have him uh, help me with this presentation as well. Uh, our, our practice as a district has been 
that when we already have a textbook that's been adopted and we need more textbooks or it's time to end up renewing it, if it's the exact same textbook, you know, if it's above $10,000, we ask the board to purchase. But if we go to a different textbook altogether, different publisher, different textbook from the same publisher, but altogether, then we put it on public display for uh, 30 days and then we ask for, for approval. Um, Trent this year uh, started as our department head for social studies. So we met in the fall and we went through some of the singleton or the, the classes that um, would be like AP Neuro and, and the such. <clears throat> and he ended up going through because of updates with AP, uh, because of updates of copyright, well, we really should get on top of this. We looked at four different, four different books. He went through a process with his team that I would let him talk about. And so <clears throat> rather than put something confusing out there where it's like, well, technically, you know, we're just renewing this and technically just, we're putting all four books on public display and then we'll come back and just ask the board to, to adopt all of them. We thought that was the cleanest way to be able to do that. Um, so Trent, I'll let you talk about the process. Thanks for having me. I'm glad I brushed up on my history. <laughs> um, first of all, I want to thank um, Matt and Brian for, sort of the re-emphasis on social studies. I, I feel like since No Child Left Behind, we were left behind a little bit. Um, and you see the ramifications of that and uh, in terms of learning loss and things like that. So it just excites me that the, the teachers that spoke earlier are, are emphasizing that now. Um, so I think that's great. So I appreciate everyone looking into that. And obviously with our society today, it's important obviously to know, but um, in terms of when I took over, I just felt like we need to be on a cycle uh, because so much is changing in, in our world and in social studies as well with standards and, and things like that. So we tried to identify, uh, we're talking with Matt, what, what are our most pressing needs now? Um, so the first one you see there is usually with these, we have maybe a five to six year license. So AP Euro is up this year. Um, and so they're due for uh, an update. Uh, otherwise, that book, we don't have online access. And really, to save money, we've only purchased um, a class set, and then the rest are online to try to save some money that way. So that's update, updated. Um, the government, uh, they, um, I think our last copyright there was 2007. So obviously, a lot has changed with government since 2007. Um, and AP government just went through a rewrite. For those of you that's un unfamiliar with that, it's how AP tests and how they go about trying to figure out who gets college credit. So it's a rewrite. So whenever you see that, you usually want a new book uh, for prep reasons to get students prepared for that. Um, our AP <laughs> economics book, uh, believe it or not, is 1992 copyright. So we're, um, I think, a little overdue for that one. <laughs> so that was pretty high on the priority list. And that book, and all these books were, we basically, uh, I went to the teachers that teach them and said, hey, what's your, what's your number one pick? And, and so um, I gave those to Matt as uh, well. And then our sociology book is a 2005 copyright. So I think all these are our most pressing needs for this year. Um, and we're trying to get a cycle so they don't all hit at the same time, um, which was obviously a big cost. So if there's any questions, I'll be happy to ask them. If not, I won't go away so I don't get quizzed anymore. <laughs> <laughs> um, so let you know, thank you, Trent, appreciate it. So let you know how this fits into a, a bigger picture for the secondary. Um, I believe it was this board ended up approving um, before the pandemic, um, or several members of this board before the pandemic that ended up approving our six through 12 general social studies series. Um, so that's been very successful. Our social studies teachers have, a, have really uh, appreciated it. Um, so like most things, they're on a renewal contract cycle, right? And so I wanted to let you know, like right now we're taking care of textbooks wherever we can end up taking care of textbooks. A lot of times for these simple things like uh, this one up here has pointed out. We are already gathering uh, information on the preparing for the renewal of the 612 social studies uh, series. Right now, the current series is well received by teachers and students, um, but we're gonna have to end up going through the process for that coming up. So if you look uh, 23, 24 next year, 
Uh, we're going to be, it's the final year for the series. We're going to start looking at that by in the fall. We're, like I said, we're gathering resources now. And then we're going to be making a recommendation uh, for that and then implementing 24, uh, 25. That's going to be um, uh, a big purchase. The, the curriculum budget, typically how, how it's set up, we can, the, the textbooks like we had on the, the other slide, we can typically buy textbooks for these because the, the budget is built such that I can end up getting um, 60 books, 35 books, and, and do a few classes like that. The larger adoptions like this, the math adoption, you know, that takes different financing where we work with Brian and Kyle and, and Dave, all the supports that helps out uh, throughout that entire process. So this is going to end up being a heavier lift and something we talked about during the math adoption to be able to be able to prepare for that. Any questions? I have one, Brian, um, for the fifth grade teachers. Can you give me some examples of what some of the hands-on projects are? Um, we found one where they researched a different topic. We, we discovered the Revolutionary War. So for the Revolutionary War, they each researched a different topic and then um, presented those on different platforms like Flipgrid, um, Google Slides. Some of them decided to make a poster. So we're going to present those to the class. For that, though, that you had mentioned in terms of before it was grabbing a lot of your own resources for um, the K through five. Um, did you find as you're piloting this, there was less time that you had to go and reach out for other resources? Did it feel like it was more able to be reachable and less time you had to spend? Okay, thank you. I just want to say that I'm glad that we're investing in this. Um, you cannot be a productive citizen in this country if you do not have the background for it. And I do agree. I think it got left behind. And I think that we are seeing the fallout from this. That's so I'm really glad we're investing in that. And I just want to add, like Matt said, uh, both, both these curriculums, we are going through kind of a formal adoption. We're going to put them on display. Um, so they will be at Allendale um, if you want to come and check those out or if you want some online access, just email me and I can get sure everything that establish your face can check I, I was fortunate with these four that I got books. And so if you want to actually touch a book, they're, they're right around the corner there. <laughs> uh, I'll warn you, they're heavy. <laughs> so, um, and then those will be on public display as well. Of course. One other quick question. With the new books that are coming for the high school level, because they're not like a full curriculum adoption, what sort of, I guess, support comes for the teachers that are using a new textbook at all to, to help guide them into starting to utilize that? Because I understand probably the My World one comes with a little bit more support because you're adopting something bigger versus when it's some individual textbooks that were maybe like updating or 1992, you know. Uh, professional development that teachers have requested for them, but three of the books are uh -huh. AP. Uh, books and so really the training comes with the AP. The AP training. Training. Okay, awesome. Thank you. So and much. we will have activation training for the SAS product. Thank you. Anything else? Yeah. No, no, ask away. <laughs> okay, I have a question for Kristen before we move mm -hmm. on. So, Okay, all right, the consent agenda is the recommend a motion that the Board of Education approve the actions contained in consent agenda items A through L as amended in um, A1, it said 2022-2023, and it should have been 2023-2024, okay? So that being said, could I have a motion, please? So moved. Second. Second. Could I have a roll call? Chet Desnet. Aye. Kate Schaefer. Aye. Maria S. Trigueros. Aye. Andrew Weyer. Aye. Audrey Adamson. Aye. Justin Anderson. Aye. Aaron Waldron-Smith. Aye. Okay, moving on to number eight is the uh, approval of the intergovernmental agreement with the city of Moline. The recommended motion is that the Board of Education approve the intergovernmental agreement with the city of Moline for student insert opportunities. So moved. Second. Any discussion? 
All right, could I have a uh, roll call, please? Kate Schaefer. Aye. Maria S. Trigueros. Aye. Andrew Weyert. Aye. Audrey Adamson. Aye. Justin Anderson. Aye. Chet DeSmet. Aye. Aaron Waldron Smith. Aye. Number nine is the approval of a letter of agreement with the University of Northern Iowa. The recommended motion is that the Board of Education approve the memorandum of understanding between Northern Iowa and the Mullingle Valley School District. Could I have a motion, please? Discussion? Carrying none. Could I have a roll call, please? Maria S. Trigueros. Aye. Andrew Weyert. Aye. Audrey Adamson. Aye. Justin Anderson. Aye. Chet DeSmet. Aye. Kate Schaefer. Aye. Aaron Waldron Smith. Aye. Dr. Savage. Yes, I just have two things. Um, each of you should have received an invitation to participate in our portrait of a graduate uh, design team uh, vision setting process that we are getting <coughs> excited to have in the spring. There are two evening meetings in March, one in April and one in May. And as many of you that would like to be involved as possible, we would love to have. And if more than a quorum of you would like to participate, we will um, simply post the meeting um, so that we make sure that we are in alignment with um, Open Meeting Act. So I just wanted to let you know, you can shoot me an email. Um, we are getting a really fantastic parent response for that. I'm very excited to see all of the requests coming in for parents wanting to be involved in that. So I'm excited and looking forward to this process. It's going to be new to me as well. So we're looking forward to uh, being coached so that uh, this process can be a success. So please let me know if you're interested in doing that. Unfortunately, there are so many activities going on in the district. It was impossible to find nights where there was nothing going on. So we tried to do the best that we could. Um, and lastly, I just have a couple of staff shout outs. Last week was a pretty harrowing week for many of our families and many of our staff. First and foremost, I wanna give a shout out to uh, the staff at Jane Adams Elementary, the teachers, the staff, the leadership, they are absolutely phenomenal. And they did a fantastic job uh, last Tuesday morning when faced with an unmanageable, unimaginable crisis. I also want to give another um, shout out to the Moline Police Department. It seems like each week we are reminded as to the importance of our partnership. And with them, we were able to navigate that situation with, um, quite a lot of ease after the initial shock and understanding, you know, you know, the, whether the threat was legitimate or not and so on and so forth. So uh, folks were there immediately. Parents um, were able to come and pick up their kids as they felt they needed to. It was a personal choice, but the afternoon was, was really uneventful and quiet. And that was uh, directly related to the leadership in that building and the teachers and staff in that building. I cannot thank them enough as well as obviously the district leadership here who was on site immediately to help navigate that crisis. Um, it is very upsetting to me that that is the world that we live in and those things are now a part of our lives and we have to make difficult decisions on how to respond and react in a way that's balanced and sensical and would, would, there is no sense to it. So um, I thank uh, everybody for their help with that. And, and secondly, last Friday at Moline High School, a student was in severe medical crisis. And were it not for uh, three or four different teachers and staff, as well as the nurses uh, there at Moline High School, responding and reacting immediately to a student in severe medical crisis, I'm not sure that um, we would be having a different conversation today uh, for that student. So I am beyond grateful for those individuals. Again, our school resource officer um, who uh, was a paramedic and rode ambulance for years was there on the spot as well. Um, we received word today that were it not for the nurses and the teachers getting the AED and providing shock to that student on site, that they would not have been able to resuscitate that student in the ambulance. So we're working on understanding more uh, and we're looking to find a way to um, recognize these individuals with the Board of Education and also law enforcement wishes to recognize these individuals as well. But as you can imagine, it was quite a traumatic event. And uh, we met with those teachers this morning and reasonably and understandably still pretty shaken up. That's not something any parent wants to endure and certainly not no educator. So um, I just wanted to uh, just share my just gratitude from the bottom of my heart for, for the people that work in this district. I feel like we get so many positive reminders. 
uh, each day of their commitment. Okay. Before I say some things, um, Corinne, do you have anything you want to report from your end or thoughts or? Um, I just want to say I'm really glad we're getting a new AP government text. <laughs> I, took AP, I took AP government last year and it like went up to Bush. So, <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. so it's hard to learn about like government when you don't have not even Obama or Trump. So okay, yeah. Well, that's I'm, a really good. I'm thing excited to, to hear about that. <laughs> Anybody great. else have anything they want to say, Justin? I do. Don't want to have to follow such a heavy moment from that. As great as those praises are, mine actually comes back a minute to curriculum team, and with the math that that's now in place or coming and all, all school year long i've heard my own one of my own elementary kids talking about how they're collaborating talking in class i never connected the two and we're just out at dinner friday night just over the weekend and they that student shares that it's math that they've been all that in i find out over a little we talk about for half an hour been a pilot been in the class with pilot absolutely loving it and i asked what the class thought about it got serious instead of all the fun laughter and the class quote it's hella good way easier and better than that stupid my math <laughs> and if that's what the kids think well done because they're excited they're in it every day and they come home talking every day about the next thing that they've been working on with the classmates. I think that's really important to share because I personally, as a child, had a really bad experience with math. And so I think it's really good to hear that that positive is starting in such, such a young place. So I think that's awesome. <laughs> um, anything else? I am just gonna come out and say, that what happened at Jane Addams and the other place is absolutely not okay. And I am taking the stance as the board president that that is ridiculous. And in this, in this community, we will not stand for threats. It is not okay. And I, I'm just, just being blunt. It's not all right. It should not have happened. And I think that it is terrible that it did. It's not okay. All right, I'm done now. <laughs> I want to preschool it. This is what I tell my preschool to No, thank you. No, thank you. Okay. All right, moving on. Um, to go into closed session, to hold the discussion of minutes of meetings and lawfully closed in the Open Meetings Act, whether for purpose of approval by the body of minutes or semi-annual review of the minutes as mandated by section 2.06 and to consider the appointment, employment, compensation, discipline, performance, or dismissal of specific employees of the district. Could I have a motion, please? So, so. All, all in favor? Aye. Okay, a motion to return, please. So moved. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right, could I have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All right, yeah.